What's up friends, my name is Jess. Welcome and welcome back to my channel. So what you're actually looking at right now is editing Jess. This video that you're watching is part two of my recent reads video where I go over all of the books that I read from January through March. Part one was posted last week going through all of the rest of the books that I read from two stars to four stars. And this video is gonna be all about my five star reads. It's not how I originally intended to do the video, which is why you're getting editing Jess instead of normal Jess, but basically too many books and one video, cut it in half. Honestly, I think this is just better for everyone involved. Without further ado, let's go back to past Jess. Okay, and now we are getting into my five star books. The first of which is The Astonishing Color of After by Emily XR Pan. This book is actually a gift from Stephanie at Stephanie Bookish. Thank you, Stephanie. In this book, our main character, Lee's mother, has recently died by suicide and Lee is convinced that she has turned into a bird. Chasing after the bird, Lee flies to Taiwan and meets her maternal grandparents for the very first time. There she uncovers family secrets and comes to terms with the circumstances that led up to her mother's death. This is a beautifully written story. I think it would be categorized as a fabulism story. I love how our main character sees the world in color. All of her emotions, the way she feels about people, the energy of a room, all of it is translated into color color and that lends for a very beautiful description of things. I really like seeing the world from a different perspective and as I'm sure you can tell from my shelf, I am a color person. But underneath all of those visuals, there is a lot going on here. I haven't experienced a lot of grief myself so take what I say with a grain of salt but I think that this did a really good job of portraying grief. I know some people have critiqued it for being too long and too slow, but I honestly think that contributes to the portrayal of grief. Our main character is almost in a fog. She's wading through this thick cloud of grief and she hasn't fully processed it yet. So to me, this being long and slow paced mimics her mental state. I do agree that it's a bit long. This is not for people who need a bunch of action and like constant stimulation. Although this is a fabulous story and the whole magical bird thing adds some intrigue to it, at its core, this is a character driven story. That's what it is. It's really a story about the themes of grief and family and history. Most of this book takes place in Taiwan as our main character is meeting the family that she never knew and learning so much about her own mother's history. Lee is a biracial character who feels out of place, can't really communicate in Chinese, feels like she doesn't belong in this extended family, but so desperately wants to. And I think that'll speak to a lot of people. And that's why I'm willing to forgive this book or the critiques that people have. The critiques are valid, of course. There is a romance subplot here that at times felt unnecessary and distracting. Personally, I didn't find it overwhelming. And while I don't think it quite fits in with the themes of this story, I do understand why it was included. Considering the circumstances that has led up to this situation, I understand why our main character is partially focused on that romance. It totally makes sense. At the end of the day, there's beautiful writing, there are heartfelt family moments, there's character development, and there's a hopeful ending. I think this book will speak to a lot of people, people who have dealt with grief, who have been impacted by mental illness and suicide, who have struggled with their self-identity, and those who have felt like they didn't know anything about where they came from and who want answers. Next, Honey and Ishu's Guide to Fake Dating by Adiba Jagidar. I often think that I'm way too soft with my ratings, but you know what? When faced with a cute sapphic romance, I don't care. I'm soft and my ratings will be too. So the events of this book start when the popular girl of the school, Honey, comes out to her friends as bisexual. Unfortunately, she is quickly shot down as they say that she can't know that she's bisexual because she's never dated a girl. Being a teenager, Hani panics and blurts out that she's dating Ishu, the only other South Asian girl in the school and somebody that her friends really do not like. Ishu agrees to go along with the lies if Honey will help her become more popular in order to win the position of head girl. This was a super quick read for me. I think I finished it in like a day. Personally, I didn't find it groundbreaking, but it was a good time and it made for a peaceful reading day. I do think it'll be groundbreaking for some people though. In the same way that I cried the first time I read a sapphic romance because oh my God, I was seeing me in these pages. I think this book will do a lot for South Asian readers, especially queer South Asian readers who not only get to see themselves on the page for maybe the first first time, but get to see themselves in such a cute, sweet romance. The fake dating trope is generally unrealistic, but I appreciate the awkwardness it created here. I liked seeing the progression of their relationship and you know, the fluttery feelings you get when you first start crushing on someone. Them falling for each other made sense because they provided a support for each other that had been missing from their lives that they didn't even realize. I've mentioned in previous videos before that I really like romances that talk about more than just the romance. And this definitely has 
more. We've got some family struggles. We've got some friendship struggles. It wasn't fully resolved in my opinion, but at the least Honey and Isha had some identifiable growth by the end of the story. I especially loved the friendship struggles because it's centered around racism and microaggressions and finally putting your foot down and acknowledging that you deserve a relationship where you can be who you are unapologetically. The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas had a similar thread to it. I loved it in that book and I loved it in this one as well. I also want to say that I liked having Hani and Isho both be South Asian and therefore must be exactly the same person in the eyes of the other people going to their school. And then it turns out that they are exact opposites from everything ranging from their temperament to their religion. And furthermore, I appreciate that Hani was a religious person. I forgot my hangups about organized religion, but it can be beautiful and impactful. I think seeing religious teens in mainstream books isn't a very common thing. And it was nice seeing it here because I want YA books to represent all kinds of different teenagers. Next, we've got The Book of Embraces by Eduardo Galeano. I feel like this is a difficult book to describe. It was like a collection of short stories of Galeano's musings with a unique blend of reality and fiction. There is truth to what he's written here. Many of these stories are those he's collected during his travels around the world after he was exiled from his country. But there is a magical realism aspect to it as well. Things that are embellished or perhaps not 100% factual, but ultimately that doesn't make them any less true, if you get what I mean. This was hard for me to get into at first. I think it took me like two months to read this book and it's pretty short. At first, I just, I had trouble separating reality from fiction and truly understanding what he wanted to say. And it was easier to read once I stopped trying to pick those things apart. I understood it better. I started seeing the truths he had to say and they were bittersweet and beautiful and painful and at times horrifying. Some of the passages took my breath away. Some told me exactly what I needed to hear. Some are things that I will never understand because while I am Latinx, I'm not Latin American. And a part of me aches for those pieces that I can't understand. He talks about death and love and fighting and truth and so many other things. I really, I don't know what more to say about it. I'm glad that I pushed through and finished this. It feels like the kind of book that I'll pick up now and then and just, you know, rummage through the passages. I don't know, maybe I'll do a whole separate review on just this book, read some passages and try to better describe what this experience was. Next, we've got The X Hex by Erin Sterling. Years ago, our main character Vivian got her heart broken and as a young witch who maybe drank her woes away a little bit too much, what else was she supposed to do but curse her ex? Considering she used a random candle, she didn't expect this curse to do more than give him like a bad hair day. But when he returns to town years later, it seems the curse is doing a lot more damage than she expected and affecting the town as well. This book delivered on everything that I promised. It did in fact feel like an adult romance mixture of Sabrina the Teenage Witch and Hocus Pocus. We got some wonderful small town vibes. We had a fun spooky time with ghosts and vicious toys. The humor and the banter were so good, not just between our main character and the love interest, but between her and her family members. And speaking of the love interest, I am so glad he turned out not to be a dick. That was one of my worries going into it because I thought, oh, if he was so bad and broke her heart, like, do we really want her to get back together with him? Yes, we do. This man was just kind of dumb. Overall, he's a good guy. I liked him and I really liked them together. I also liked the bit of urgency that was added to the story by having a dangerous curse. It just made me really happy reading it, you know? I've heard that there is a companion novel that's coming out that's supposed to center around our main character's cousin. Absolutely gonna read that one as well. All right, next we have The Ark of the Scythe trilogy by Neil Shusterman, starting with book one, Scythe. This series takes place in a distant future where humanity has conquered death and created an all-knowing AI called the Thunderhead that takes care of everything. Because humans are no longer dying naturally, however, somebody has to take control of the population. And so now Scythe are the ones in charge of death, selecting people and killing them. It's an honorable duty and two of our main characters have been chosen to apprentice as Scythes. This book dragged at first, but I couldn't put it down by the end. I loved the concept, loved seeing how the Scythes function and how their whole organization was structured. Our main characters, Citra and Rowan, go through a lot and they change a lot throughout the course of the series, first book included. I think their development was masterfully done and can really show how a change in circumstances can really change a person while simultaneously not always changing who they fundamentally are. We've also got a rich cast of side characters, some of whom I feel very strongly about in both positive and negative ways. There was one character, however, that I just want to mention. They had a very fat phobic description, so keep in mind that that's something you're going to read if you want to read this series. In terms of plot, once it ramped up and we got past that first dragging portion, the plot was super entertaining. I was never entirely sure what was going to happen. It kept me turning the page. There was a romance subplot, although I don't think it overwhelmed 
found anything. It wasn't fully fleshed out. Like I can see how the romance developed in the first place, but Schusterman doesn't really show us those moments that led up to it. We just kind of have to infer. And I do want to mention that interspersed between the chapters of the story, you get entries from the journals of different sites and you get to see their musings on life. And I loved the discussions of what it means to be human. And if we are still human, when you take away things like mortality and pain, there's some great philosophical questions happening in the series. And I forgot to mention, Scythe actually got four stars, but book two, Thunderhead got five stars and book three, The Toll got four stars. In general, all three of them together, it just felt like this was more a five star series than a four star series. Book two, The Thunderhead was by far my favorite of the entire series. It expanded the world so much more. I love seeing how different parts of society function and the different ways in which the Thunderhead and immortality has impacted humanity. My favorite thing about this entire series is just the questions it raises about what it means to be human and what it does to us when you take away fundamental parts of nature. In the series we have more point of views, our characters are developing a lot more, we've got some morally gray characters, the Thunderhead is a lot more present in this story, and I am a sucker for AI so I loved getting to know it better. There's more corruption and political scheming in this book, the schemes are intricate, it kept me guessing, and this book out of all three of them I think had the most thrilling ending. Like I mentioned the toll got four stars, there was a lot packed into this. There was a lot going on and I think this book suffered from that a bit because it got a bit messy. It took a long time to get to the parts that I wanted to get to but even so again I loved the expansion of the world. I couldn't stop reading. I loved seeing how our characters had grown and how they had changed under the weight of their experiences. There was no way that I could have predicted the way that this story was going to end and I honestly don't know how I feel about the ending yet but it was epic and I think all of the little threads that had been planted in the first two books, I think they were generally resolved. So I think this was a good ending to the series. I'm satisfied with it. I don't really need another book. All right, and we have finally gotten to the last book in this video, Grown by Tiffany D. Jackson. By far the best book that I have read in the past three months. This story is essentially about abuse in the music industry. Our main character, Enchanted, is 17 years old when legendary R&B singer Corey discovers her singing and takes her under his wing. He is 28 years old. Our story begins when Enchanted wakes up to find Corey dead and she has no memories and blood on her hands. This felt like a book I did not want to read. It was hard to pick up this book whenever I took a break from it and then it was almost as hard to put it down because it was so painful to get through. It was painful because it was painful to see what was happening to Enchanted. So often YA shies away from being realistic about the darker side of life. And some people argue that kids shouldn't be reading about things like that, that abuse and other hard topics shouldn't be in teen books. But teens find themselves in abusive relationships all the time. And now there's a book to represent their experiences and hopefully show other teens what to look out for when it comes to grooming and abuse. I can't recall another book that I have read recently that has made me hurt so so badly, as if I was physically struck. I just kept thinking, oh, oh sweetheart, oh God, it hurt not being able to protect Enchanted. And for all of those reasons, I think this book was expertly crafted. It's easy to see how Enchanted ended up in the situation that she ended up in. There was an interesting duality of perspective that Jackson had to balance between clearly showing us what's wrong here, while also showing us why Enchanted doesn't see it. It was horrifying to see how Enchanted's perspective and her mental narrative and her character changed as she went through everything. If you can handle this story, you should read it. The only criticism that I really have is that there's a detour with Enchanted's best friend at the end, which was a weird subplot that I just didn't understand, but it gets resolved. So overall, phenomenal book. If you want to share your best or worst books of the past three months, please put them down in the comments below. I'm happy to hear it. And if you've read any of the books that I mentioned in this video, let me know what your opinions of it were. And now I'm going to let y'all go because if you have gotten to the end of this video, Video, you have stuck around for long enough. I will see you in the next one.